okay so let's start the class so we talked about uh, class constructors so here was the example of the skew struct that we had created and then i motivated why you need a constructor because otherwise the main program would have to initialize the members of the struct and then we talked about a constructor so the simplest constructor that you can create is this default constructor without any arguments and in general you can have constructors which take additional arguments so here you have this constructor which can have any number of arguments and then when you create an object with those arguments you will be using a syntax like this okay and this is uh, an example of uh, a class with uh, these two constructors one is this default constructor and this is the constructor with arguments and uh, then we talked about the copy constructor so in the copy constructor you uh, you call this constructor every time you create a variable by initializing it from some other variable of the same type so when you create the copy constructor you have to use a particular uh, method of passing the arguments so you have to use a const and then you have to pass the argument by reference this is very important and uh, then you can do anything you want inside the copy constructor and um, this is uh, the copy constructor yes okay so uh, i are people following the discussion which is happening on moodle somebody asked a question about why is the copy constructor not called in the return statement and the follow up responses have also been correct so basically the main uh, the main i did not know that last class that uh, when you when you do a return where the return structure is by value then the compiler has the flexibility of creating the struct to be returned in the in the memory area of the calling program uh, directly so so suppose if you you just call a struct and you return that struct then that struct the compiler can optimize and call it uh, and create it in the main program say suppose if your calling program is the main program it will create that struct in the memory area of main therefore when you return that struct you don't do any copy but you can change that default behavior but uh, in other words this is not um, sort of a guarantee that we, so this, the question that i have set which asked you to print something when a copy constructor is called that is uh, in some ways an illegal question because it depends on the compiler in some compiler the copy constructor will be called in others it won't be called is it fine any other questions yes yes because the compiler uh, is not one pass it looks at the whole function and for very simple functions it knows that oh i just created this struct within a scope and uh, it's just going to be returned so the compiler can do you know may you know sort of things which produce the same result you are not supposed to care about the internals of where which variable is allocated where so basically you if you have copy construct with side effects this is called a side effect a side like if you print something there is a side effect so you you are not guaranteed that the side effect will uh, will take place when you depend on the return statement to do the side effect of copy okay, okay. so then uh, destructors so destructors are uh, called every every time a, a particular struct or class uh, comes goes out of existence which means it ceases to exist and typically that happens when a variable is declared within the scope and the scope gets over which means that you have just put a end curly braces 
So then the scope is over, the vari variable is uh, to be destroyed. And uh, then if you have registered a destructor, you do not have to register a destructor for every class or struct that you create. If you do, then that particular function call will be made implicitly. You are not explicitly calling the destructor, the compiler implicitly calls the destructor. So, you know, we last line we went through this example of a destructor which has this side effect of printing uh, an error message when the queue was non-empty. So this is how you create destructors and we, we had gone through this syntax last class. Yes, order of calling the destructors. Yes, so actually last class we discussed this question that when you have uh, multiple variables declared within the same scope, uh, it appears actually this part uh, I have not double checked whether it is part of the compiler rules or whether this is something that we are observing only on, on Pruter that the variables are destroyed in the reverse order of their creation. Okay. So here we will talk about operator uh, overloading. So. Um, uh, so actually last class I might have given a wrong impression that you can create any symbol you want for overloading. That is not true. When you do operator overloading, you are uh, supposed to use one of a finite set of symbols and the list of symbols that you can overload is given in the book. Uh, and there was a question about the precedence order of uh, operators. So the precedence order of operators is what is fixed among the set of symbols by the compiler in advance. So when you apply those operators on integers or other primitive types, whatever precedence order is being used, the same precedence order will apply even when you overload it in your struct. So suppose in your struct, you, you call your operator as multiplication which is the star and then you overload it to implement something other than star, the operator precedence will be that of star which means it will be executed before plus. So actually at is not among the list of applied uh, valid operators, I did not know that. So you, so when you did over, so this is like in this example, I do not think you can because in the, in your textbook, this was uh, not a valid operator. So can you overload, create an operator like at? So let us say we create an operator. So we have this operator and then we want to overload operator at, okay. And let us say it just takes a, It does not matter what we, we will just return star s, okay. So I do not know whether this is allowed or not, let us see. Yeah. So it will not allow anything other than the operators which are in the list and that includes the typical operators that you have already encountered which is all this less than, less than, less than equal to, equal to, equal to and uh, all the standard arithmetic operations plus, minus, division, multiplication, uh, plus, plus, but that becomes a unary operator. We are not covering unary operators here. You can also overload the index operator, like say in an array index, you can use box bracket to access an element of the array. We will talk more about that when we do strings, okay. Yes. scope is no because uh, so the question is suppose if you have an outer block where you have created a variable and now you reuse that name inside an inner nested block when you re reuse that name does the outer scope variable get destroyed no because that variable is still in existence its memory is still reserved for that variable so when you come out of that inner scope the variable is still available for you to use
okay so if you do multiplication so th the compiler just looks at the multiplication symbol which is the star symbol and decides that it has higher precedence than the plus symbol internally how you have implemented the star symbol is not of uh, interest to the compiler okay so so here in the previous class we were uh, doing this experiment where we overloaded so we had defined last time the star operator and the addition operator for vector v3 okay so if you use the so ignore this part about strings so suppose now we have created uh, say out equal to uh, say s dot x and uh, you remember this was the ut times at square by 2. We have this equation and we have overloaded the plus and the multiplication operator. And in this case, the precedence that is followed is the precedence order of multiplication having higher precedence over uh, additions. So you will first do this multiplication, then you will and within the same precedence you go from left to right. So next you will do this multiplication and then you will multiply the result with this. It's not like you will first multiply these two scalars, oh, it's an easy thing, let me first multiply this and then I will involve vectors, that won't happen, okay? So this is the, this is the precedence order and uh, when you execute it, for example, this does the right intuitive things in the sense that u is multiplied, you know, you do ut plus at square by two and you get answer as 210. Okay, now let's say we think that what's there in a name, that's not true. Suppose now we use the same logic, but we replace, we are going to use the minus symbol for actually implementing multiplication. Okay, so how you have implemented the function remains unchanged, it's just the symbol used for representing multiplication has changed. In this case, you will see that the compiler will give you the wrong answer because it does not know that minus is actually multiplication. So if you, so here the execution order, you will get the wrong answer. And the execution order is that, you know, now it just looks at minus and it knows that minus has the same precedence as plus. So, and it's going to just go from left to right, okay? So it will just do this, uh, subtraction, then this addition, then this subtraction. So that's why you get a very different answer. Yes. Ah, that's a very good question. So here, you know, in this case, you had a, a, a function, an operator, which was actually working on a double F and it was doing the multiplication. Now the question is, suppose if you wanted to, um, so, so he, this is convenient because the whenever you define an operator, then the left hand side is assumed to be a struct on which you are calling whatever is there on the right hand side, okay. But sometimes you might want to interchange, right. If you have a struct, say suppose if you, uh, you have defined multiplication and if you have a V3, a V object, and then you have a float time object, you might want to call both V star T, in which case multiplication will happen correctly, and T star V. They are both correct as far as, you know, a non-programmer is concerned. But the implementation is very different. In this case, you know that you will just have to call on the V struct, the operator star, with the argument as t, okay. Now in this case, what should you do? Because there is nothing defined between a float and v3. You know, the rule for operators is that it will always apply on the left hand side the function where the symbol makes sense. 
So in this case, you will get a compile error. If you don't want it to give you a compile error, then you need to actually create a new operator which can handle uh, a float and something of type v3. Okay, so that operator can be created as if it's a independent function. Like so the way we create functions, so suppose if we wanted to implement such a functionality, then so we want to return something of type v3 and then we will define an operator and this is the operator star, this is like a function that we have defined and the arguments of the function are the double f and then we say that we have a, a const v3 v and now you can uh, just return v3 and then you can just say v dot x times f and v dot y times uh, f and v dot z times f and uh, this will work okay now so this way you can now you can also write so instead of so let's uh, go back to our same multiplication notation so here instead of writing u star t you can also write t star u that will also work because we have defined that operator okay if you want to know which star is being called we can just say um, method two called you can print this and you will know what's happening and here we can just say method one called for each of these so you expect one call for method two and uh, one two three calls for method one and that's what you get Ah, so the minus sign was a hack. I was trying to explain that operator precedence in when you even when you overload operators, the operator precedence is what is determined statically by the C++ language that the star symbol always has higher precedence than the plus or minus symbol. What I was trying to show with the minus is that instead of star, if I use minus, then the uh, precedence of minus and plus are the same and then the expression will be evaluated from left to right and and even though minus actually implements the multiplication logic i have not changed the implementation of minus even then you get the wrong answer because the precedence has changed Yeah, but, but when I had redefined, so it's not like the compiler knows that minus for struct is actually multiplication. It does not understand so much. It just takes it literally that the symbol, it just looks at what is the symbol, whether it is star or division or plus or minus. It totally decides on the precedence based on the literal symbol, not on the implementation. it would have been the of course plus we have already redefined so here you know so so the symbol that you use for this operator is is what is used to decide on the precedence order not what you what code you have written here that has no consequence but the, what symbol you have used decides on the operator precedence because the compiler has statically decided that you are going to give higher precedence to plus multiplication and division and after that we will have plus and minuses. So that precedence order is totally based on the symbol, not based on what types of argument it works on. That is not, that is ignored, that is not, that is ignored. Yes, what the symbol you use, that is what decides on the operator precedence. Because it is fixed that the particular star symbol has higher precedence than the minus symbol. Okay? Yes. Yes. 
So when you have more than one symbol in the operator, Yeah, but that would be a different because operators are only defined over binary arguments, right? So that will be another operator. Yeah. Uh -uh, uh. So in method two, so this is a multiplication operator that I have defined between on the left hand side having a double and on the right hand side having something of type V3. That is what this function is saying, that every time I see the symbol star between a variable of type double and a variable of type V3, then I am going to execute this piece of code. And inside that piece of code, I can do anything I want. Yes. Yes, yes. Because the when you decide on the precedence, that is independent of the logic which is implemented here. It would be the same, yeah, and if you had, for example, if this was the operator, and if here you do mi did minus or something very low precedence, it would still have a higher precedence because you have used the star symbol there. Okay. Yes. Ah, that's a very good point. So, could we have implemented this as follows? return v plus v star f yes you could have done that that would have been much better you are basically implementing commutativity you're just saying that this operation is commutative so you're just implementing that yeah. yes here yeah it can be anything you can actually overload. So suppose in, it does not even have to be a, oh now the question is if the compiler has already, so you are overloading that, it should allow you to overload. Let's see. So then you are trying to return something of type say int or what do you want to return, the return type? Double. So this, this should work too. So you, you have created an operator and now let's go back and make sure that this will not give us an error. So this is some independent operator that you have created between int i equal to say 20 and now you want to do c out t dot i, okay. This should work too, this should also call, uh, you know, so let's see whether it does that or not. star must have at least one parameter of class or enumeration type. Ah, so you cannot overload uh, operators on primitive types. Yeah, you could return a primitive type, but you have to, it will not allow you to overload basic operators. No, we have changed the return statement. See here, I changed the return type to double. I am just returning v times f, that is okay. Yes, but this is over, I am now calling it between, yeah, and it is not allowing you to do that for primitive types. No, so it says clearly that you cannot overload operator star unless one parameter is of type class, forget about enumeration type, we have not done that. So one of the parameters has to be a struct, if you want to do over operator overloading. Well, you have, there is no original operator defined over that struct, because you just created that struct. See, actually we are not able to, this is invalid, you got that, right? I mean, we are not allowed to, okay. Yeah, so if you call here, say, i star t, that still remains. The star operator over other types maintains it, uh, its old functionality. Yes. So, yeah, so don't be confused by the fact that when we say operator overloading, 
it just means that the same operator symbol can be called on new types and however the operator was called on earlier types for example primitive types that remains unchanged okay. yes and and is allowed yeah i think it will still throw because that is also not a yeah i would pretty much uh, i would guess that it will throw a compiler error if you call say and and is not is defined over boolean types and now you want to define it over a float and an int i from the error message it looks like it will continue to be unhappy okay and then we talked about the this pointer many people were confused about the this pointer think of this as a fixed member of any struct which contains the address of that struct of course i when i say address of the struct when i mean i what i mean is that address of a variable of that struct type okay and if you have different variables of the same struct type they will of course have different addresses and from within that struct you can always use this as if it's a member of that struct to refer to its address so this is a method for a struct to look at itself it's a kind of reflexivity property it can look into itself because of the this pointer so so here it's uh, just a, a silly example to show what is present in this so this is a pointer if you want to get to the contents of this you use star this and now when you do star this dot x this is just a very roundabout way to getting x you could have just written length as just x times x instead we can just write this roundabout way to access the x member of the current struct on which the length function is being invoked okay so so just to reiterate this length implementation is identical to earlier the way we have implemented uh, somewhere earlier we implemented length by just saying x square so they are identical okay we had done that earlier right just x square plus y square these are two identical ways to say the same thing so now that you understand that this pointer we can talk about the assignment operator and overloading overloading the assignment operator the assignment operator is very closely related to the copy constructor and you don't have to declare the assignment operator so in today's uh, graded lab you will be asked to implement many different kinds of structs you don't have to bother to implement reimplement the assignment operator because by default for structs the kind of structs that you will be writing the default assignment operator will do the right thing it will just copy all the members from the right hand side to the left hand side structs but sometimes we will see later you might write uh, structs where the members are pointers where you might want to do something special in such cases only you will want to overload the assignment operator and when you do overload you have to follow a particular signature of the assignment operator the first requirement is that the return type of the assignment operator is a, a reference to the left hand side variable so with that we have uh, say in this case the q operator uh, for the q struct we have defined re overloaded the assignment operator and notice the return type is a reference to uh, q struct and the uh, right hand side is again a reference to uh, something of type q and then what you return is basically star this with this particular uh, definition of the assignment operator when you return a value you are not allocating any extra space for the return value because the return value is just returning a reference to the object which already exists so access control was very simple if unless you have questions i am just going to flip through those slides
yes ah uh, public and private is to enforce discipline in uh, uh, in the usage of classes so that the uh, whoever is implementing those classes has the freedom to change the internal organization of the class without affecting how it is being used so for example you might have implemented the queue class and you currently say used an array to to store the elements and very soon you are going to hear about vectors and they are so much more awesome than arrays and now instead of arrays you want to say use vectors so then uh, somebody who is using the queue and just doing inserts and removes in the queue should not need to know that internally now you don't have arrays but now you have vectors because to them what matters is that you have something where you can add object and from where you can remove objects so that is that is if you declare your members as private then you have the freedom to change the array to a vector later without affecting the code of people who are using your class yes because then it becomes then it's not an assignment you cannot do assignment from any type to any arbitrary type you will get a compiler error yes yes yeah actually you know what uh, this was uh, at what happens is when i teach sometimes i modify in the slide in response to questions and then i by mistake i saved that slide so it was in an inconsistent state but now i have updated it that was wrong this is the correct definition no this is a pointer we talked about pointer variables right so if you want to refer to the content of that address you have to use star you remember when we were talking about pointer variables so this is just looking at the content of that address this stores the address of that of that variable of, uh, of of a variable of that struct type okay yes yes here there because we don't want to create a new copy for the return type most of the time when you create an assignment you know the main reason we return a value is in case you want to do cascaded assignment right say so suppose if you want to do something like uh, uh, v1 equal to v2 equal to v3 okay these are three variables so now you do this first assignment and the first assignment has a return value which is a reference to v2 and that will be passed as argument to the second assignment and then the values will be copied over and you will just get a reference to v3 but thereafter no one is looking at v3 v1 right so that is the default most of the time you just do an assignment you don't look at the result of an assignment so you don't want to make a copy for a return type so this is a very efficient way to do an assignment so that you are able to refer to to do this cascading without too much overhead it's an efficiency concern yes no 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 see q you cannot put see and you can put only before variables okay and you when you at the end of types so this is the data type you remember struct is not a variable struct is a new type like int and you can have float and similarly here you have q and it means that the return is a reference to a variable whose type is q yes well actually it's value but then finally when you look at the return type it says you are only interested in reference to that struct see reference and address when we say 
address of a variable that is actually the physical hexadecimal address okay when we say reference then inside the float folds it is address but you can use the result of a reference type as if it is a base variable you don't have to use any other star after that you can just use the dot notation to access the members of that variable okay yes but it's not explicitly declared as a member the compiler provides it to you as an aid okay but you don't explicitly declare declare it it's always available to all struct types that are created okay yes No, you cannot do that. So the assignment operator, you can of course always declare, you can always create a sort of a new function which takes as argument any other data type, but not this. No, you can, in once you have decided to overload the assignment operator, you can always assign, you know, copy some members and not copy the others. That is up to you. Okay. Yes. Const in the argument? Yes, in fact, in this case, we should have used const in the argument. That would be the correct implementation of the assignment operator. I think both, if, whether you use const or not, both will work, but the correct thing would be to use const. Okay. Yes. No, you cannot overload assignment for primitive types. We have seen that for other operators also. Okay. Okay. So now uh, let's uh, talk about. Um, uh, input output classes. So these are two classes which are provided by the compiler for you to uh, sort of input and output things. And these are special classes in the sense that so these the class is of type iStream. So C in is a variable whose class is iStream and C out is a variable whose class is O stream. Okay. And these are predefined in C. And on these classes, iStream and OStream, these are the two operators, the two famous operators which are used extensively, less than, less than for C out, for outputting things on onto the screen and the greater than, greater than for C in, for reading things from a keyboard, okay. So uh, another class is IF stream, which is sort of like iStream, which allows you to do uh, input from a file. So, so far we have been doing input only from keyboards, but later we will see that you can also do inputs from files which are stored on your computer. If you want to do inputs from file, you can create a member of type IF stream. Okay. And, uh, and, and similarly, and you can read from the file in the same way that you read from C in. And you can also output to a file by using this special class OF stream. This is also a class like O stream. And you can then write into file like in the same way that you write to C out. Okay. And when you use these uh, special classes, you have to include a special header like say F stream if you want to use IF stream and OF stream. So here is, a, here is an example of file IO that you can do. So you include fstream in your program and then you do ifstream and in file this is a variable that you have declared and in the constructor you have to give a name for that variable. So this is this can be any arbitrary string so you have given this as the name. This is the input file and then you can also have an output file and for that output file also in the constructor you can give the name. Now you have these two new variables available to you in file and out file that you can pretty much use in the same way that you use C in and C out. Okay. So for example, you can put it in a program in a repeat statement 
and then you can like instead of see in you can use in file okay and you can read uh, integers into your variable and then you can you can use uh, you can output instead of see out you can just use out file to output things onto v okay so this is it about classes okay so now i am going to start a new topic which is uh, uh, basically um, looking at a very famous library which is called the standard template library which provides many very useful classes so once you go through what that library provides you will really appreciate the worth of object oriented thinking and why you need to have access control and why you need to have this isolation between the members which are available within the struct and the members which are accessible from outside and the worth of operator overloading so as a user of some well in implemented classes you will really appreciate the worth of classes okay so the most famous class and we have been waiting for this class uh, ever since we ditched character arrays is string class okay so we are going to start with talking about string class and then later we'll talk about more awesome classes like vectors and maps and sets okay so so now for uh, the string class so we are going to talk about uh, this standard library and uh, the standard library is uh, basically it comes with every c++ distribution and it contains many functions and classes which you need in uh, daily programming and these classes have been optimized and they have been debugged thoroughly uh, so if you use them then you can write very compact programs and they will also be typically efficient because they are very clever about how they how they manage memory and every thing like you know searching and all has been implemented with the most efficient algorithm possible so generally whenever you can it is recommended that you use a class from the standard library unless you are solving a cs101 assignment and we explicitly forbid you from using a st standard library class okay so we are going to talk about uh, these set of classes the string class and later the vector class and then the map class okay so they are all three of them are really very useful okay so first the string class okay this is uh, so we never talked about any of the other uh, string classes so this first line so so basically the string class has a bunch of useful constructors and it has some very useful operators so here so you whenever you want to use a string class you have to do hash include string but sometimes if you include other header files because strings are useful all over they might have already included string like in simple cpp string is already included and in that case you don't have to explicitly include string and now you can create a, a variable of type string see note this variable name is small s it's not capital s so it's um, whereas typically when you create classes you are expected to use capital the first letter should be capitalized that's just good programming style uh, when you create classes so this is the string and this is the variable and this is a constructor where the constructor takes as input an array of characters and uh, you can also have you know the copy constructor is also defined for the string class so this is the copy constructor and then in the string class they have overloaded the box bracket operator because of that you can pretend as if string is an array of characters so when you do v2 you will get as a return type a character and in this case you will you will what character will you be returned for v you will be returned character c okay and now when you do v2 equal to v3 v3 is character d so in the in this third position you will overwrite the character from the fourth position which means now the string will become a b d d a b 
So remember that when you use this box notation, you are pretending as if the string is an array of characters and you are accessing an element of that array using this box notation. Although we are not saying that it's an array of characters internally, it might be implemented in whatever way, okay. And here is one very useful function defined on the string class, which is the substring function. So sub str, this, yes, will it call the constructors of? Because, you know, if, if any time you create a variable of a particular type, then you have to invoke a constructor. It could be a default constructor. Yes. So that was true for any class. Earlier, we were talking about copy constructor. So suppose if you had done in another way in this, uh, the third line could have been written is that, so this is another way to write the third line. This will call the copy constructor, even though it looks as if it's an assignment, okay? Okay, and then when you, so this is the function I was talking about, the sub str, it stands for substring, it's just a short way of writing substring. So substring takes either one or two arguments. When it takes only one argument, then it means you are interested in the part of the string starting from position 2, in our case it is starting from this character C up to the end of the string. So when you do substring 2, you will get as answer, because we had overwritten the C character, you will get as, as the answer DDAB, okay. Does everybody understand that substring 2 will return DDAB, okay. And in the second form of calling substring, you give a you give another argument and this argument is the size of the substring that you want to return. It is not the ending position of the substring, it's the size of the substring. So it means starting from B, you will be returning three characters, which will be B, D, D. So this is what you return. Yes. Ah, you can also create an operator with the operator symbol as just a box bracket open and close. Okay, so um, so then uh, this is another useful function on a string class. You can do v dot find. So you have a string class object. You do a find, and to find you give as argument. Either you can give a character, but in this example we are giving as argument another string. And when you give it as, as argument another string, then it will return to you, if this substring exists in the string, it will return to you the starting position of this substring in the string. So in our case, A, B, C, D, A, B, A, B appears in two positions, here and here. So by definition, find will return to you the first occurrence starting from the beginning. So in this case, it will return a value zero. Okay, because that is the location of the first point. Now, if you, so after you have found it at location zero, suppose if you just do, a, you call again, find with a location, you can give a second argument, which is the point from which you will start looking for the substring. So in this case, if you give as argument one, which means skip the zeroth position, now start looking for a, b from the second position onwards, then what will it return here? What will be the value of j? 4, because this is where it occurs next. Yes. Yeah, if the part isn't present, then you return a special symbol, which is again defined in the string class. This is called string colon colon n pose. This is a special thing which has been defined in that class, okay. So this particular, uh, this is like a constant and there is a type for every constant. This one actually it would like, it would have liked to call it as unsigned int, but unsigned int is a very long unwieldy name. So it has created even a new type inside a string. There is a new type called size underscore t. So string n pose is of type size underscore t. 
Another function in string is size and length. These are both equivalent functions. When you say s dot size or s dot length, this will return the number of characters in the string. And this return type is also of type size underscore t. Okay, because it just uh, is a convenient way for it to say that it's an unsigned int. So you can pass a string by value, by you know, or by reference. And there are many other useful operators defined on strings. You can do less than uh, or greater than, less than equal to, and equal to equal to. Um, uh, so and concatenation. If you just do one string plus another string that will concatenate two strings. So the string class has like, you know, some 10 or 20 operators which do many cool things, which enable you to write very compact code uh, manipulating strings. And before people were using string class, you know, when you had to implement all of these functionalities using character arrays, there were lots of errors involving you know how should the string end you know where do you store the length of the string imagine if you used a character array then somehow somewhere else you have to tag along the length of the character array or you have to have all st strings of the fixed of a fixed length here you have lot of flexibility in what you do with strings because of the string class okay so does everybody understand the definition of find and substring yes Yes, it should uh, it should be size underscore t. But int i, it can convert from unsigned type to int. Then it will be, um, actually it will be minus one. So basically unsigned, uh, but you know, you're not supposed to interpret that. In your program, when you check for whether the variable is present or not, you should have checks of this kind. So this is the code that I commented out, let me show you. So when you are dealing with string types, let's say now, so here are some examples of string uh, manipulation. So suppose I have a string here and uh, I want to, I read as input another string. So I do see in, this is my search string and then I, search for the string in my main string. So first let me ignore this part, okay. I can do this check. If m is equal to string colon colon n pose, it means the string has not been found. So then it will say that, uh, so yeah, I have just, just used it uh, to be of type int, but um, but it, uh, it has done the type conversion, okay. So, but the right thing would have been to call it this, okay. So, let's say now in the input, I specify, say I am looking for BC. And uh, so here, we expect uh, Ah, it's still unhappy about this particular thing. So it has found the string at position one. And so I want to make two more comments here. So, so after it has found it in position, say suppose if I'm interested in looking for the second occurrence of the string, then I can write this slightly uh, convoluted code where I say look for first the string starting from the 0th position and uh, because I know that a second occurrence exists, I can do a plus 1 on it, otherwise it's an illegal operation, okay. I do a plus 1 on it and then it will look for the second occurrence of the search string, okay. And so we can do that. And now it has found it at the second occurrence which is the uh, location 7, okay. The other thing I wanted to note, you to note is that in the string class, even this less than operator has been overloaded, okay. So when I say string less than search string, 
So my third string was BC. Okay. So BC is uh, is actually actually lexicographically it is um, it is actually higher than ABC because ABC starts with A. So therefore, it returns a true which is printed as one here. So in the string class, the less than operator has also been overloaded. Okay. So now when you call less than on these two arguments, you are essentially doing a lexicographic ordering of the two strings. So the two strings that we are talking about is this and our search string happens to be BC. So lexicographically string, this string because it starts with A will appear before the search string. So therefore, th this particular Boolean condition evaluates to true, right? And that is what is being printed over here, one, which is the true evaluation of the, yeah, it's the, that is called the lexicographical ordering of the variables. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. If, if you, if you had say SRCH, you want to give it some variable, some string which does not appear in just number one. Okay. So in that case, I cannot use this nested call. Okay. So, and, uh, okay. So this is my input now. Okay. So then you will find that the string does not appear. Not found. Okay. You have not found the uh, string. Okay. And also you see that it has uh, printed, uh, you know, so here let me put a return, you know, a new line. So now you have also it has found that the search string is actually lower than lexicographically in the lexicographic ordering it is lower than uh, string. Okay. She actually had questions. Yeah. The int type. Size underscore T. No, that is the correct return type for that is that will work too. It is just done the type conversion. If you write M equal to see in this case, it is getting convert which is more expressive. Uh, I don't know. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So that is important for uh, people to understand. So what I was interested in is that I was, I had given as a input say BC and I was interested in getting to the second occurrence of BC. Okay. So when I do a string dot find with the search string, if I don't give any argument by default, it will start searching from the beginning. Okay. And that will return the first occurrence of the substring. After it has, and the return is the starting position of the first occurrence. Okay. When I do plus one, then definitely that match will not succeed. It will look for the next string after the first match. And that's how I will get the second match. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So that is wrong. Oh, no, no. This one, I just wrote it wrong. This was, I just placed it wrong. But earlier it was placed here. Okay. Yes. Yes. The, uh, okay. I don't know. There is a fixed lexicographic order and whether the ASCII code is lexicographical or not, I don't know. No, capital A lexicographically appears before small a. I think so. No, so ASCII coding may not be uh, consistent with lexicographic ordering. So there was somebody at the back who has not asked much. Yes, yeah. Yeah, ASCII and all. Okay. Yes, actually I am looking for rare question. In? Yeah, so the second argument in find, so this is guys, this is important for everybody to know that the second argument in find is the position from which you will start looking for the substring. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
so that so basically when you do the first call to find it will return to you the position of the first match and so in our case the position of the first match is say 1 okay so when you do plus 1 to it now that becomes 2 it means now you are asking find to look for the substring bc from position 2 onwards no 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 well, plus 1 is outside the first find but inside the second find so here so it is inside this find okay i could have written the code in a less confusing manner by doing it like this okay so let's say so we first say that size underscore t the first match so first match is this okay and what i am doing is first match plus 1 okay so that is what you are getting as the location of the second match yes It can be uh, an integer or a size t variable. 1 and a, see because we have read it into a string, 1 becomes a string. It is not an integer anymore. So a string is just of characters. A character can be a digit or an alphabet or a punctuation. 1 appears before, uh, you know, numbers appear before digits. Sorry, numbers appear before alphabets. Yes. Can we end pose? Can can I cover that again? Yeah. Okay. So end pose is the value which is returned when the when you call find and you do not get a match. So if I called say find with x y z and x y z has no match, then the value that is returned is end pose. Yes. 